Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Tina Beth Pina celebrating the holidays at the American Museum of Natural History. The origami holiday tree has marked the start of the season at the museum for over 40 years. The tree is delightfully decorated with more than 800 hand-folded paper models created by local, national, and international origami artists. Knowledgeable volunteers will also be on hand to teach visitors of all ages the art of origami folding. The origami holiday tree will be on display through January 7th. Another holiday tradition in New York is the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. Our Mike Gilliam takes us behind the scenes for one of the most best known and loved holiday treats the city has to offer. When the 36 Rockettes are on stage delivering their world-famous eye-high kicks, it's truly something special. But getting to that point is hard work. Much of it takes place at a rehearsal space in Midtown Manhattan. The Rockettes' days are long and physically taxing. I wake up, I make my coffee, I sit and watch the news a little bit, and then I make my way over to the rehearsal hall. Uh, I get here about a half hour before rehearsal starts to do some personal stretching, tape my feet, we're really good on blister prevention. Pretty much exactly how you'd see us rehearse every day, Monday through Saturday. Six hours a day, six days a week, six weeks before we open. Um, it's really rigorous. We're athletes, we're constantly doing something and everything has to be as precise to the pinky. We do up to 300 kicks a show, so we want to make sure that we're stretched and warmed up, ready to go. The Rockettes have been stars of the Radio City Christmas show since 1933. Decked out in costumes accented with 3,000 Swarovski crystals each, they've managed to stay sharp and relevant for all these years, in large part due to choreographers like Julie Branham. I constantly try to keep people on their toes and, and fresh and the choreography new and fresh. So every year we decide amongst ourselves, the, the uh, director of the Rockettes Creative and myself, what, what we could do to up our game. Because we always want to keep upping our game. We want to keep people coming back for the traditional things, but we also want them to be able to see new and exciting things too. She has help from Tracy and Hannah, two seasoned Rockettes who are out front at every rehearsal and can play every part. They're assistants, which means they assist the choreographer, so they teach a lot of the material, but they are also dance captains and swings through the show, so they probably have one of the toughest jobs around. So they have to know everything, they have to know every part because they could get thrown on the stage at any time, and they have to keep their brains working because they're teaching so many parts all the time. And when they're not rehearsing or performing on stage, they're still working behind the scenes. If they're not in the show, they'll watch the show. That's how we keep it clean throughout the entire season so that we stay on our toes. Because you know, when you do a lot of shows in a row, you can get fall into a habit you don't even realize you've fallen into. So we, that keeps everybody honest, I'd say. Every day we have rehearsal, six days a week, six hours a day, and then we have Sundays off. It's a lot, but it's definitely worth it. It's long, um, you know, we're writing down all these numbers and depths, that's how um, we learn everything. It's set on this grid, basically, of, this, of the stage. So it's a lot on our bodies, but we have a really wonderful athletic training program that takes care of us. And, you know, we jump in the ice baths at 5 p.m. Oh, definitely <laughs> not something that I was used to for this being my first year. Um, the first time, it's definitely painful, but I felt amazing afterwards for a 10-minute ice bath. But yeah, <laughs> it's great. And they promise this year's show will be another great one. The Radio City Christmas Spectacular runs through January 1st and on some days from 9 in the morning until 10 at night. It will definitely put you into the holiday spirit. I'm Mike Gilliam for Arts in the City. When you get invited to a holiday event this year, chances are you might see an ice sculpture gracing the room. And as our reporter Minnie Rowe found out, these creations are pieces of art that take hours, if not days, to create. The way we carve this is kind of a, a combination of, of, of kind of old school craft with hand tools chisels and saws, plus the, 
the power tools, chainsaws, you know, die grinders and drills. From bears and swans to cars, Star Wars, even a life-size chessboard. If you can think of it, Shintaro Okamoto can carve it. We've done, you know, furniture made out of ice, an entire room made out of ice, uh, portrait replicas, interactive material products and, and designs. Every day, Okamoto Studio churns out works of art made completely from ice for clients with household names such as Martha Stewart, Uniqlo, and Porsche. Sometimes the pieces are carved from one solid block. Sometimes it's several pieces fused together by slightly melting the ice and letting physics work its magic. Every time it results in a dramatic masterpiece that Okamoto urges people to touch, feel, even lick. I love, you know, putting our work out and having people who didn't expect it come across it and then be able to interact with it and learn about our craft and what we do. So that's a really great feeling as an artist to really kind of directly connect with people and then kind of contribute uh, some kind of knowledge that then they can then spread. These striking conversation pieces all begin life as a massive flock of frozen water. Okamoto makes his own ice in these machines that take up to three or four days to create a giant ice cube that stands four feet tall and weighs about 300 pounds. First, Okamoto etches out the sketch. His chainsaw slices into the ice, and like melted butter, it cuts, molds, and finally transforms the frozen mass into what can only be described as a cool piece of art. Working with ephemeral material like like ice is, um, you know, kind of falls in a realm of something closer like performance art. Okamoto credits his talent for ice sculpting to his father. A trained sushi chef from Japan, Takeo Okamoto discovered a passion for ice art while pursuing his day job. The elder Okamoto was so passionate about his craft, he moved his entire family to Alaska in the pursuit of ice. I remember, you know, one boring winter uh, day took us to a frozen lake and took out a chainsaw and cut out a block of ice, pulled it out, uh, and uh, actually sculpted a swan and gave it to a friend as for, for a big house party. At first, Okamoto says ice carving was just a way for him to spend time with his dad. But soon he was hooked, and the duo entered competitions across the country from Fairbanks, Alaska to Central Park. In the 90s, they would set up shop in Queens, New York, where they carved their way through the heart and hearts of New York City. I think what makes our work fun and challenging and interesting and fulfilling is that we get to do our work here in New York City. In New York City, it's the center of top tastemakers of all industries. So we get to really change hats every day, working with event designers, fashion designers, to product designers, doing fashion shows and film premieres and replicas of designs, and artists that we open our studios to to do different commissions and collaborations. Depending on the subject, ice creations can take anywhere from an hour for this swan to an entire day and more, as in the case of this life-size replica of an elephant. And while these beautiful carvings stand tall and proud for many hours, eventually, as ice is wont to do, it melts into a puddle of water. True to his Asian upbringing, though, Okamoto is philosophical, almost zen, in the temporary nature of his craft. When you experience something that's going away from, right in front of you, I think it makes that present moment that much precious. And I think it's that kind of relationship with, with memory and presence and time uh, that, that, that is clearly art of its own. I'm Minnie Rowe for Arts in the City.
Looking for a great holiday gift? How about a page-turning thriller? Our Donna Hanover spoke to veteran New York journalist Linda Stacy about her latest novel, Book of Judas. Linda Stacy is well known as a journalist now writing for the New York Daily News and as an author whose first novel, The Sixth Station, introduced us to lead character Alessandra Russo. The plot for Linda's new novel came to her when she happened across two history books, I, Judas, and The Gospel of Judas. This gospel had been found in the 1970s in Armenia, Egypt, lost and found and lost and found on the black market, stolen, returned. And then I'm reading, it says it ended up rotting in a Citibank branch in Hicksville, Long Island. I grew up in Hicksville, Long Island. And then it says, and the Broadway branch of Citibank in Hicksville, Long Island. Hello, that's where my parents had their account, where I had my first account. Linda says this gospel states Jesus asked Judas to point him out to the authorities. And it says in the gospel of Judas, that Jesus says to Judas, without a crucifixion, there can be no resurrection. You must do this thing. What happened when the gospel was found in Hicksville? National Geographic purchased it, and then they took photographs of every single little piece of it. A lot of it is missing. So that's where the premise of my book starts, with the missing pages. My theory is, what if the missing pages had the secret of resurrection? That would be worth everything in the world. So in Book of Judas, intrepid reporter Alessandra receives the stolen pages and goes to Israel hunting for the key to get the container open. As research, Linda went to Israel, including to a relative's beautiful modern home in the desert that had a most unusual basement. There's digs all around his house. They were digging and they found this tunnel that led to under his house. It's a 3,000 year old burial tomb in his basement. That's how I got the whole scene about crawling through the tunnel and coming to a tomb. As a young reporter, Linda was a single mother, and in the novel, Alessandra has just given birth, so she faces some of the same challenges, like trying to show her newsroom that she can still get the big story. Linda wrote in the previous novel that Alessandra chased down a man who may have been a clone of Jesus and also that she saw her sexy lover killed in front of her. At Linda's launch parties for the new novel, writers like Nelson DeMille and many celebrities wanted to know if the baby's father is the lover from the previous book and if there's any chance he's still alive. Or will Alessandra at least find another love? I don't want to give anything away, but yes, she, in the middle of all this, she has one of the steamiest love affairs you could ever imagine. Some of the scariest scenes take place in the Second Avenue subway during construction as it was being blasted out of the bedrock. I got to go down into the cavern that was the Second Avenue subway as it was being built, which was even scarier than going through the 3,000-year-old burial tomb. Linda says that the art of fiction gives her a chance to chase a certain kind of historical big story. I think Judas has gotten a bad rap, and, and in the Gospel of Judas, the original pages that were pieced back together, Jesus tells him that he will get a bad rap. He tells him, you will be the most hated man in all of history, but you must do this. If you love me. If you love me. So if you always thought that Judas was the ultimate betrayer in history, you might want to think again and read Linda Stacy's novel, Book of Judas. Turns out he might have been a hero. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. Gingerbread is synonymous with the holiday season. And I met one man in Queens who works on a gingerbread winter wonderland all year long. Meet John Levich, the chef and creator behind Gingerbread Lane, the four-time Guinness Book of World Record holding annual display of gingerbread houses. When I started doing it at first, I wasn't very good at it, and people mocked my skill level and where I was and things of that nature, and it was a matter of getting better at it to prove the naysayers wrong, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've proved them wrong and then some at this point. 24 years later, Levich designs, bakes, builds, and decorates gingerbread villages for a living right out of his home in Queens. About one month start to finish. And actual labor in that whole period is a couple hours. 
but you really need these things to get hard as a rock before you move and, and dry. And, and that's a battle, is, is to get them to, to be dry and to stay vertical. And what's the secret behind his record-setting gingerbread villages? It is three ingredients, gingerbread icing and candy. Nothing else in it. Guinness won't allow you to use wood, styrofoam, plastic, glue, nails, staples, anything. It has to be all entirely edible and it has to, and you can't also use chocolate to stick things together or marzipan or fondant. The only secrets I truly have is use a ridiculous amount of icing. John works year round, creating four separate villages that are displayed nationwide, including one you can visit at the New York Hall of Science. He uses thousands of pounds of icing, gingerbread, egg whites, and of course, candy. Are certain candies better than other candies to use? Candy coated things are the best. M&M's, Skittles, uh, compressed dextrose candies, things of that nature. Anything that's sanded, uh, has like a, a sugar on the outside of it, those things work the best because they will attach and stay attached for a million thousand years no matter what you do to them. Toffees don't work at all. Licorices, jujubes, things like that, they'll look cool but they won't stick to the icing. Although the inspiration for his villages comes from what he sees around him every day, John's greatest inspiration is the public's reaction to his work. It's a very euphoric feeling to see the way people react to it and the way they love it. Then when you stand there immersed in thousands of people that are like, ooh, oh, look at that, oh my god, that's so cool, look at the reindeer. It's awesome that in a world like ours where there is so many things going on that, that you've created an escape, maybe it's a 10 minute escape if, at most, but, but sometimes that's all you need to, to reset yourself mentally and people really do consider Gingerbread Lane something that can help them kind of forget things for a while. That's a good thing. If holiday time means theater time for you, Pat Collins is here to suggest some of the best shows Broadway has to offer. Stick a pin in the map of the desert. Build a road to the middle of the desert. Tony Shalhoub has the leading role in The Band's Visit, a musical based on the 2007 film about an Egyptian police orchestra stranded in a small town in the Israeli desert. The downfall of a 1980s Wall Street junk bond king is the subject of Junk, a new play at the Vivian Beaumont Theater. It's the circle of life. The Lion King is celebrating its 20th year on Broadway. The Julie Tamor directed musical won six Tony Awards two decades ago. I'm embarrassed that I did not know enough about my, about my ancestry to pass on to my kids. Latin History for Morons, John Leguizamo's one-man comedy, was inspired by his son's school assignment on Heroes. That motivated John to set out on a fact-finding mission spanning three continents to explore Latino history and culture. Kinky Boots' original stars, Stark Sands and Tony winner Billy Porter, rejoined the cast through early January. When you're falling in a forest, and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? The title role in Dear Evan Hansen, which brought Ben Platt at Tony, is currently played by newcomer Noah Galvin. The scurrying door slams. The Boss, Bruce Springsteen and his E Street Band perform at the Walter Kerr Theater through June 30th. The cast of Miss Saigon takes its final bows January 14th. The last Jellicoe Ball will be held when Cats closes the end of December. <laughs> Bette Midler bids goodbye to her Tony winning role in Hello Dolly on January 14th. Bernadette Peters is the new Dolly beginning January 20th. David Hyde Pierce also departs when his co-star dies. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City.
Back in December 1944, world-famous opera singer Regina Resnick made her debut at the Met, and the rest, as they say, is history. Here's a sneak peek at the documentary celebrating her illustrious career that CUNY TV will air throughout the month of December. Let's take a look. Regina, she was legendary, and uh, and and the the range of roles she played was uh, unparalleled. She was so wonderful to work with. The Carmen performances with her were a joy for me as a conductor. Because she was fierce, people were also afraid of her. You don't need me to tell you what a great artist Regina Resnick was. Everybody knows, the world knows. Regina was one of the stars that I looked up to as a human being, as a teacher, and as a damn good artist. Liaisons, what's happened to them? Liaisons today. I thought we were really lucky to have um, a great opera star. Regina had a 40-year history of having sung with every great conductor in the world. She directed operas and flourished and went on in this whole other career uh, where she became like a teacher of her craft. This fairy tale Cinderella story New York story, really. It's a very courageous and audacious career. It is my happy duty to welcome you to the world of Downton Abbey. Everything's the same. It's making me so nostalgic. The attention to detail is fantastic. It's just lovely to see all of the costumes. You'll find there's never a dull moment in this house. Experience the history, the fashion, the house. Welcome to Downton. Downton Abbey, the exhibition. Coming to New York for a limited time only. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine is an iconic house of prayer. It's also home to a number of historic artifacts. Join us now as we tour some of these precious hidden gems. My name is Bill Schneeberger, and uh, I'm standing here in one of the most incredible buildings in New York City. It's called the Cathedral Church of St. John of Divine uh, here on Amsterdam Avenue in 112. This is said to be the largest cathedral in the world and uh, we'll welcome you here. What's interesting about this cathedral is that it really was the catalyst for this whole area known as Morningside Heights to develop. Property was purchased in 1887, building started in 1892. So we have a lot of interesting artifacts throughout this building, uh, gems as you call them. Keith Herring, just before he died, created this particular triptych. It's made of bronze, and it was specifically made for where it is today in, in one of our chapels back there. So it's, it's his last piece. The 9-11 Memorial is a, an interesting piece of sculpture um, in which uh, the hands show uh, the two planes kind of coming through and crashing through in a very symbolic fashion. 
But the baptistry is the first one that you would come to on the north side of the church as you're walking, uh, as you go through the chapel. It has a beautiful sculptural facade around the interior part, some of which are actually painted, which gives the idea of how sculpture was treated in the Middle Ages. We also have two um, beautiful menorah, large menorah, uh, that were given to the church uh, by Adolf Oakes, who was the editor of the New York Times. I think basically in gratitude for the church's outreach to the Jewish community here in New York City. So they're beautiful, made of bronze, uh, and um, they're actually fashioned after the ones that you would find in the Arch of Titus in Rome. Aside from all the things that we've looked at and that, you've, that we've talked about, uh, I certainly welcome you to come back to the cathedral uh, at any time. We're open seven days a week. There's much more to see here. We have tours. We can take you up onto the roof on a vertical tour. Uh, we can take you to the crypt below. There's so many things to see here. It really is a, uh, uh, just an encyclopedia of knowledge. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv. Thanks for watching. I'm Tina Beth Pina, and we'll see you next time on Arts in the City.